And so I look forward to your videos where you demand that they start plucking out their eyes and cutting off their right hand. Sounds to me like the devil would want you to believe that. <laughs> He's using scripture out of context. The devil is a red horn lord of hell. Didn't exist. It means sexual sin, generally. All right, here we go. This should be fun. Hey everybody, welcome to Redeemer Reacts. My name is Kyle, I am one of the pastors here at Redeemer. What qualifies me to be sitting here? That God has put on my heart to, to be a minister of his gospel. And I have gone through lots of training, but ultimately what qualifies any of us as those who are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation is that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and we've been given his perfect and unchanging word by which we can gauge whether or not people are speaking the truth or speaking lies from the world. So we're going to look at a couple of videos here and just kind of try to get an understanding from scripture of how we're to react to these kinds of things. All I can see is a picture, but I'm going to play this video and see what happens. Hey everybody, so Brittany here says that you can't just pick which Bible passages fit you. You have to take the Bible as a whole. Well, Brittany, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, you are to take your stubborn and rebellious son into the center of the city and stone him to death. So, Brittany, I look forward to your videos where you advocate killing teenage boys because you can't just pick which passages from the Bible you like. You have to take the Bible as a whole. According to Matthew chapter 5, Brittany, Jesus says that Christian men who lust after women are to pluck out their right eye and cut off their right hand if it causes them to sin. Now, I don't know exactly what Jesus is referring to here by cutting off their right hand, but I do know that many Christian men do struggle with lusting after women, and so I look forward to your videos where you demand that they start plucking out their eyes and cutting off their right hand. But you're not going to do that, are you, Brittany? Because you do pick which bad Bible passages fit you. You pick which Bible passages fit you that you can misinterpret in order to justify your homophobia. Brittany, that's pathetic. Do better. God bless. I love the uh, the smugness at the end of the video is just so indicative of a servant of God who is not quarrelsome, right? This video, it, it doesn't shock me. It does it does make me sad and kind of upset me a little bit because this is a very common type of critique against scripture that allows people to live the life that they want to live. He's actually guilty of what he's accusing Brittany, this person who he's responding to of doing, which is selecting and choosing scripture that you're going to obey. And he's justifying his behavior by accusing her of doing the same thing and therefore saying, we're all doing it, that means it's okay. When in reality, what he's done in his examples is showcase his mis understanding of hermeneutics, of progressive revelation, of the application of scripture. He uses this example from Deuteronomy about taking a rebellious son into the city square and stoning him and using that as a, a way to say that that's not something that Brittany's going to do. That's not something that anyone's going to do. And therefore, all of us pick and choose which scripture we're going to obey. But what we know from the New Testament, what we know from the book of Hebrews, what we know from the life of Christ is that Christ came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to abolish it, but he came to to fulfill it for us in righteousness so that we didn't have to pursue God through our righteous behavior like under the old covenant. Even though nobody was saved that way, they were still saved by faith in the future Messiah. But the point is, we need to look at scripture and look at these uses from the Old Testament in the context in which they were given. When we take them out of context and we throw them around like this, in order to make excuses for our current sinful behavior, we're actually doing a disservice to the word of God. Now, he does go into the New Testament and say, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that if your uh, eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. But again, he's using scripture out of context, looking for a meaning, imposing a meaning onto a text that the author didn't mean. What Matthew is talking about is taking drastic measures to remove sin from your life. He's using an argument from the greater to the lesser to say, go to the farthest extremes. He's not telling us to mutilate our bodies. He's not saying wooden literal pluck out your eye. What he's saying is go to the most drastic measures you have to to remove those temptations from your life because, as Jesus clarified, the law is not just about the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Meaning, when he says, if you're not committing adultery, that what the Pharisees would have said is, You'll be, you'll be fine so long as you're not actually following through. But Jesus is saying, even when your mind goes to that place, you have violated the law. And what Jesus is establishing for us is the standard of righteousness that is so far out of reach for us of God's holiness that we need to be reminded by that, that we need somebody to accomplish the law for us. And the good news is that that is the person and work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so in a video like this,
this where somebody's trying to justify their own disregard of scripture by somebody else's disregard of scripture. Firstly, he set up a false dichotomy because he's going after a very explicitly stated sin that is repeated not only by Jesus, but by most of the New Testament writers. I'm going to 1 Corinthians 6 and in verse 9 it says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now the question is, can you inherit the kingdom of God even though you have done these things? And the answer is yes, because if we look at the grammar and the, and the structure of this, it's not talking about those who have committed them. It's talking about those who are committed to committing them as a lifestyle. It's describing people that this is how their life is characterized. We know that because verse 11 says, and such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified. You were set apart as holy. You were justified. You were made righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of God. And the implication is that when that happens, we no longer seek after the repeated practice of these things. We may stumble in various areas, but they do not define our lifestyle. You know it's all Eve's fault for listening to the devil in the Garden of Eden. You mean the snake? The book of Revelation says the ancient serpent is the devil. Some Christians interpreted it that way later. But at the time the story of Adam and Eve was written, the devil is a red-horned lord of hell didn't exist. But Satan is in the Hebrew scriptures. Kind of. The word Satan, which means adversary or opponent, does show up nine times in the Hebrew scriptures. Five times to describe a human military, legal, or political opponent, and four times to describe a divine being. Although one of those times in Numbers 22, the Satan is on God's side, doing good, not evil. So the snake in the garden is literally a snake, or metaphorically something else like desire or free will, but it's not the devil. So it pretty much sounds to me like the devil would want you to believe that. <laughs> There may be various uses of the actual Hebrew word Satan, which does mean accuser. But when you put the article on the front of it, that makes it a definite individual, the Satan, the accuser. We see that person in the book of Job standing before God, accusing mankind of their sin. Throughout the Old Testament, the person that she was fake dialoguing with did say the serpent of old. This is the description that connects the two, that when the serpent shows up, the serpent is Satan personified. He is the accuser. He is the deceiver of mankind. That title would not be given if he had not, in fact, deceived mankind. And he continues to try to deceive mankind by telling you he's the good guy through people like we see in this video. And so when we get to Genesis 3 and we see that the serpent says, now the serpent was crafty that means he's clever, he's cunning, he's sharp-witted, more so than any of the other beasts of the field, right? And so he's in the garden here and he says to the woman, he doesn't lie to her, he asks her a question that deviates slightly from the truth and gets her to start questioning God. And that is Satan's heart and motive. Did God really say? And so when we see a video like this showcasing, oh, the devil's not this and he's not that and he's actually a pretty good guy and sometimes he's on God's good side, also again, puts scripture under the lens of criticism, which asks the question, did God really say? Did God really say Satan is the bad guy? We know from Genesis 3 that he asked these questions. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Well, no, he didn't say that. He said we couldn't eat of this one tree, but he's caused Eve to question her own understanding of what God said already. And she begins to impose more law. She says, yeah, we're not supposed to eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. And we're also not allowed to touch it or will die. Also, there's some, some interesting kind of play that's in the Hebrew language that we don't see in the English. Eve says that we will die forever, that we will surely perish forever. And the serpent says to the woman, you're not gonna drop dead. He tries to numb it down. You're not gonna die right now. You're not gonna drop dead. For God knows that in the day that you eat of these fruit, you will your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And his implication is, don't you wanna be like God? Isn't that a good thing? So everything that God has said, he takes and twists the words to make them sound correct but they're just incorrect enough to pull you off into sin. And I would suggest that this video that we just watched is misinterpretation of this passage. To characterize again Satan as not a bad guy, uh, as a good guy, we see this throughout our culture. There's a TV show called Lucifer, for crying out loud, where he's kind of the funny antagonist. And so what we see is that this culture, which is ruled by Satan, Ephesians 2 says that all the dead, the sinners are dead in their sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of 
the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And we know that some of those sons of disobedience, including daughters of disobedience, will claim to be servants of the king. But in reality, they're actually posing as servants of the king and they're serving Satan's ends and means by trying to describe him as something other than he is, which is the deceiver, the destroyer, the serpent of old, and the one who is at enmity with God. And the one that God says in Genesis 3 is cursed above all of the beasts of the field. How do we know that this is speaking beyond just a snake? in the garden because verse 15 tells us, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is not speaking about an immediate animal interaction here. This is speaking about the entity that is animating this animal in the garden because this has long eschatological implications. And so when you see a video like this where somebody tries to be clever with the words and try to turn the Bible on its head, give it a different meaning, especially when it's from a person person who is clearly unqualified to handle God's word, ignore it. All right, here we go. This should be fun. Bible doesn't say sex before marriage is sinful. Yes, it does. This is a great example of what is called proof texting, where somebody lists a bunch of Bible verses that they claim prove their point. But if you actually zoom in on all the verses that this creator lists, they prove my point. The Bible does not condemn sex outside of marriage. The verses this creator references condemn porneia, which is mistranslated as fornication, which is what I say in the original video. If you look up the Greek word porneia, it means sexual deviancy. It means sexual sin, generally. It does not specifically refer to sex outside of marriage. It was mistranslated in 1611 by the King James Bible Translation Group, and they used the best knowledge they had to translate this very complex Greek word. But we now know that porneia refers to a much broader range of sexual deviancy than sex outside of marriage. The Bible does condemn adultery, which is breaking your marriage covenant and cheating on your spouse, but it does not condemn sex outside of marriage and it does not prescribe that sex must only be done in the context of marriage. But this was a good try. Well, he tried to dunk at the end of the video, but he he airballed it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a fairly common misconception when speaking about the interpretation of these words. And and what's what's really fascinating to me is that every single word in the Greek New Testament that is contested in this way has to do with sex. Every last one of them, whether it be homosexuality, whether it be no, that just means kind of femininity in a man, or no, that means just the act of receiving, or no, that means that doesn't that's speaking speaking about imagery, it's not really speaking about the act. Well, if we're going to go there, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, because what Jesus says is very important here. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. So he makes the comment that pornea or that sexual immorality is only referring to adultery or pornea in the sense of, of imagery or deviancy, which by the way is a, like it's like a third or fourth level meaning of that word in, in any Greek lexicon. And so we don't take a third or fourth level meaning of a word and impose it on a text, nor do we do words word studies and impose whatever meaning in the list of meanings of that word that we want onto a text. The context has to determine what the use of that word actually means. But I think this is a good passage to look at because it connects adultery and the looking at a woman to lust after her in any possible way. And I think that kind of creates a, a closed loop that includes everything that falls in between these categories. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. And effectively, the Pharisees would say, hey, I'm not committing adultery. I'm not sleeping with the woman so I can stand on the corner and look at her and catcall her and we can fool around a little bit so long as I'm not actually going through the act of adultery. But what Jesus is saying, comparing the letter of the law to the actual intended spirit and interpretation of the law is this, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So in speaking about any kind of sexual activity between any man and any woman, the law, according to the Pharisees was as long as you're not violating your marriage vows. But what Jesus is saying connected to that is if you have even participated in entertaining the thought in your mind, then you are guilty of committing adultery with her in your heart. And so what we need to understand by this is that Jesus is setting up a comparison between the level of righteousness that the Pharisees think they're achieving versus the infinitely higher and unattainable level of righteousness that God demands from his law. And the question is, are we going to stand before God 
God on our own account as those who exercise the law? Because if we are, we're gonna be found guilty. Or are we going to accept the sacrifice of Christ on the cross on our behalf? Will we repent and follow Christ as our Lord and Savior? Now, does that mean that if I follow Christ as my Lord and Savior that I can't pursue what I wanna pursue in my life? Well, when somebody else is your Lord, you have to do what they command. And Romans 10, 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's not just a statement of saying words, that's an expression that says that our life confesses that we follow Jesus as our Lord. That means that everyone can look at us and see characteristically that we are in submission to Christ as the one who is in command. And we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. The second half talks about the fact that God has supernaturally given us an understanding of an impossible truth, that somebody came back from the grave, and that can only be accomplished by God through his divine power. And our trust and our hope and our salvation is in that work, that Christ has been raised from the dead, he has killed the curse, conquered sin, and he is the first fruits of our redemption. We have to understand all of this in light of living under submission to Christ. And never anywhere in the New Testament are we given any kind of license for sexual behavior outside of the confines of marriage. What often people want to do is try to read in the white spaces and say, well, if it's not explicitly forbidden, then I'm going to do it. And that means the Bible not only says that I can do it, but that I am free to do it. But even in, in the clarity of conversation with sexual deviancy, they're going to look for every excuse in the book of why words don't mean what they clearly mean in the context, which is that God designed sex from Genesis 1 to be in the confines of a marriage relationship, that a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is God's creation, that is his design, and that they should be fruitful and multiply. So that design for sexuality is relationship with a husband and a wife, a genetic man and a genetic woman come together to enjoy relationship with one another, intimacy with one another, and to procreate, to be like God and procreate and fill the earth and exercise dominion over the earth. Of course, man fell in that call and that command, and so Christ had to come and rescue the kingdom. But nonetheless, nowhere in the New Testament are we permitted to experience sexual behavior outside of the confines of marriage. And no matter what kind of hermeneutical gymnastics somebody tries to do to say, well, this word doesn't exactly mean that, and this word was mistranslated by the King James Bible and those various things, they're all excuses to find ways to sin. God's ethics and morality from what he built into the fabric of creation has not changed because God does not change. And so if we're only going to pick and choose passages that give us permission in some way, we're going to deceive ourselves and fall into sin. We remember what the prophet Jeremiah said about the heart, that it is deceitful, it is desperately wicked, it is sick, who can know it? So this idea of following our heart's desire, when we go to scripture, if we're not careful, we can make scripture mean whatever we want it to mean. We can take words, we can twist them, we can twist the language. This is why it is important to say that when God wrote the text of scripture, he had an intended meaning and we must find that intended meaning and live by it. So if we're going to do what this person in the video said, then we're going to get ourselves in trouble and find ourselves living in a pattern of sexual immorality or deviancy that puts us outside the kingdom of God. So what I hope to accomplish through these discussions is to illuminate you to the truth of God's word, that we do not get to stand in authority over God's word or what it means, that God's intended meaning of a text was spoken into a text. It was locked in grammar and history and context, and we must find those clues to find the intended meaning of any given passage. I do not hate these people who are in these videos. I have sympathy for anyone who is lost in sin. Ephesians 2 says that we were all lost in sin, following the course of this world, and that we were by nature children of wrath. And it's not until God intervenes. Verse 4 of Ephesians 2, God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I also understand from Romans chapter 10 uh, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we want to use the word of God accurately and share that with you with the hope that God will use the exposure to his word to activate faith in your life and bring you to repentance and a trust in Christ so that you can find salvation as well.